Hello, my name is Scott Winship, and I'm the director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility, or COSM, at the American Enterprise Institute. COSM conducts research and develops policies aimed at expanding opportunity in America. We seek to reduce entrenched poverty, increase upward mobility, and rebuild social capital. COSM scholars and AEI affiliates include some of the nation's foremost experts on poverty measurement. We've gathered several of them to provide a kind of primer on opportunity in the United States. Angela Rashidi will open by exploring the meaning of poverty, outlining the most fundamental decisions and measuring it, and describing how different poverty measures address those decisions. Rich Burkhauser will then discuss the history of poverty measurement, the weaknesses of the official poverty measure, and what an improved measure indicates about our success in reducing poverty. Next, Kevin Corinth, Deputy Director of COSM, will talk about one common but controversial poverty indicator, the Supplemental Poverty Measure, or SPM. He will describe its shortcomings and the political machinations around this measure. Bruce Meyer will close out the presentations with an exploration of the future of poverty measurement, highlighting the importance of underreporting of income in government surveys and the promise of poverty measures based on consumption. We will close the webinar with two group discussions led by Angela. The first will include Matt Weininger and me. Kevin Rich and Bruce will join us for the second. We hope this will be a useful resource to you in your work to help the most needy among us. With that, I'll turn it over to Angela Rashidi for her opening presentation. Thank you, Scott. Um, and it's great to be with everyone who has uh, joined and who has interest in our webinar. Uh, as Scott mentioned, I am going to provide a rather brief um, but uh, kind of broad overview uh, of what is poverty uh, and uh, provide kind of some basics so that we all are on the same page, not only about what defines poverty, but how we measure it. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, just kind of thinking about what actually is poverty, uh, because it's extremely important as policymakers and as scholars discuss poverty uh, that we're all using a common definition. Uh, and we really do need a common understanding of what poverty is so that we all can be on the same page and have this understanding, not only when we measure it, but when policymakers are developing poverty or developing policies to try to address poverty. Uh, historically, uh, poverty has been defined as uh, this concept of economic deprivation. Um, there's certainly other definitions of poverty that go broader than that, maybe go into social constructs. Um, but historically, again, when the original poverty measure was developed in this country, um, and since then, it really has been this concept of economic deprivation. Um, but then the question is, what is economic deprivation? Um, because there certainly can be different perspectives on what is economic deprivation. Um, and that's when we get into some of the challenges or some of the complexities around not only defining poverty, but then once it is defined, how do we measure it? So conceptually, we can kind of think of poverty in uh, what we call absolute terms, where we're kind of thinking of it in terms of a fixed standard. Um, so economic deprivation in terms of a fixed standard of what are uh, you know, basic needs or what is material hardship, but that standard is fixed. And then we look at how that, um, uh, how uh, individuals or households resources compared to that fixed standard of economic deprivation over time. Another concept we think about in poverty when thinking, again, about how do we define it is relative poverty, meaning we can define poverty in relation to others. Um, and that's where you can uh, we often compare resources to others or compare where individuals or households, again, for example, fall in terms of the distribution of all others. So these two concepts being an absolute or relative um, concept of poverty is kind of throughout uh, our understanding of poverty and then again, how we measure it. So I'm just gonna touch on the basics of poverty um, and move into how we measure poverty. Again, we're thinking conceptually, conceptually about poverty being uh, economic deprivation. 
So at the most basic level, in order to reflect economic deprivation, in order to measure it, we have to be able to first define resources. Um, so what, again, individuals, households, what they have as a resource. Uh, and we compare that to a threshold. Now, a threshold, again, building on these concepts of absolute and relative, a threshold can be an absolute threshold where it's based on a fixed standard that changes over time only based on inflation or the changes in the cost of things. Or we can have a relative threshold where this concept of poverty, again, is how are people, uh, how are the resources in a household changing compared to everybody else? But whether we use an absolute or a relative concept of poverty, the same basic definition uh, is used uh, in terms of we first have to measure what people's resources are, and we have to compare that to some sort of threshold, whether it's a fixed standard or well it's, whether it's a relative uh, standard. Uh, I think it's also important uh, not only to be on the same page in terms of how we define poverty, but we also have to have uh, goals for what an effective poverty measure is, what it should actually be measuring. Um, and there's certainly different perspectives on what that should be. Um, but a, a group of us uh, scholars, uh, those that are presenting today, came together uh, uh, in 2021 to really think through what would be an effective poverty measure from a policy make, maker perspective. And we came up with these three kind of goals. One is that uh, a poverty effective poverty measure should identify the most economically depressed population. If it's going to accurately reflect poverty, it should identify the most economically deprived population. The second is that the measure uh, must change with uh, uh, change, the measure itself changes when eco economic deprivation changes, meaning that that's a constant uh, assessment of economic deprivation over time. And then third, we must be able to, or policymakers must be able to assess how their policies are affecting economic deprivation, and they need a measure in order to do that. So all of those goals or concepts um, are important to consider as we think through what are the implications of different poverty measures and what are the implications of the data that we use to measure poverty. So I'm going to just quickly illustrate again at a very high level how some of these concepts play out in uh, the measurement in, in the real world. So again, if we think of poverty, a poverty rate or poverty measure as resources over a threshold, we first can look at what uh, we call the official poverty measure. This is an absolute pov poverty measure in that the threshold is a fixed standard that is only adjusted for inflation over time. In the official poverty measure, the resources, or the top half of that equation, uh, is money income, meaning mostly cash that comes from earnings or comes from government benefits, such as Social Security, uh, Social Security disability, that is cash that goes into a household. And it's measured through survey data. Uh, so surveys asking individuals in households about their money income. And again, official poverty measure is compared to a threshold. What it doesn't include is government benefits that are not what we think of as cash. And we'll get the other presenters will get into more detail about that issue. The second thing we'll hear a lot about is the supplemental poverty measure. The supplemental poverty measure differs in both how it measures resources as well as the threshold that it sets. In terms of resources, it includes that money income that I talked about, but it also includes government benefits that aren't necessarily money income, such as food benefits, tax credits, things like that. The threshold is not an absolute threshold, it's a relative threshold. This definition that you see here in terms of how the, the threshold is set comes directly from the report that outlines the methodology. And you can see that what makes it relative is this that they're identifying expenditures between the 30th and 36th percentile of distribution of expenditures, meaning that that changes over time depending on how people uh, spend uh, on these core 
core goods, food, clothing, shelter, utilities. So that threshold is moving. It's not a fixed standard. It's moving as the distribution of expenditures changes each year, which makes it relative. Uh, this slide and chart just shows kind of the implications of using a relative and absolute poverty measure. This chart comes from uh, a report put out by the National Academy of Sciences uh, looking at child poverty. Uh, the first two in the chart are relative poverty measures. Uh, one is based on 50% of median income. The other is based on an SPM threshold for the U.S. and applying that threshold to other the other countries. And as you can see, in both relative measures, the U.S. is an outlier in terms of higher poverty rates compared to other countries. But when you use a fixed standard, absolute poverty measure, where they are um, you know, adjusting dollars based on other countries' currencies, the US no longer is an outlier. So this, I think, really emphasizes the importance of understanding the difference between the, the, the measures, whether they're relative and absolute, as well as how those resources and how those thresholds are, are defined and the data that we use to support them. And then finally, um, everything I've talked about so far in terms of the, the different measures have relied on income as resource, using income data, what people report uh, in terms of what they receive as an income source or resource source. There's also other data that is used to measure um, the resources. Um, and our later presenter, Bruce Meyer, will get into much more detail about this, but there's also what we call consumption-based measures which use expenditures um, rather than income. So what people report that they spend rather than the, the income that they receive. And again, the same concepts of whether it's relative or absolute can be applied to a consumption-based measure. It's just using a different source of data uh, to try to measure those resources and develop those thresholds. So I am going to end there um, and hopefully provided a, a broad overview of the issues that we intend to explore in more depth through our next presenters. Uh, I am going to now turn it over to Rich Burkhauser, who is going to go through the history of poverty measure measurement in the U.S. Um, and provide some trends uh, in different poverty measures. Rich. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, in uh, March 1963, uh, Walter Heller, who was then the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, sent a memo to President Kennedy based on analysis by Bob Lantman outlining the rules of engagement uh, for an attack on poverty. Uh, three days before his assassination, November 1963, President Kennedy told uh, Heller that this uh, war on poverty was going to be part of his uh, 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 program for the following year. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you about uh, uh, two papers, uh, next slide, uh, that uh, uh, talk about uh, the uh, war on poverty as uh, LBJ defined it, uh, starting in 1963, that paper is coming out in the Journal of Political Economy in January, and uh, the book by Robert Lantman, who talks about how uh, the original poverty measure was created. Uh, next slide. Uh, President, uh, next, next uh, quote. Uh, President Johnson, in his uh, uh, address to Congress in uh, 1964, uh, said that one fifth of our people were uh, not sharing the abundance, uh, which has been granted to most of us, uh, whose gates of opportunities have been closed. Uh, that number, that one fifth, is the key initial starting point for the war on poverty. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that. But in, in uh, a second quote, he says uh, something about not only uh, how uh, whether people are in poverty or not, but how they get out of poverty. And what I'm going to say is, with regard to the first, we, we've had a great success with regard to the second in terms of them working themselves out of poverty has been much less successful. Okay, next slide. Uh, what are the conditions necessary to evaluate success on President Johnson's war on poverty? First of all, uh, you have to think about how Bob Lantman created that distribution 
uh, which created that 20%. All Bob was able to do was take the best data possible to show you a distribution of people across income levels, sort of a, uh, a U-shaped uh, distribution. Uh, what uh, President Johnson and his administration did was to decide at what point uh, they would say people were in poverty or not in poverty. Uh, that was a scientifically arbitrary but politically uh, policy relevant 20% uh, baseline to what they chose. So that's the first point. How do you get your initial poverty population? Uh, it's a political decision uh, ultimately. Two, you hold, what do you do over time? Angela mentioned this. Uh, President Johnson focused on an absolute standard. That is, he held the uh, income thresholds uh, to establish poverty constant in real terms uh, by only increasing uh, uh, that, those thresholds by the inflation rate. Second, he rejected uh, the link uh, to changes in economic growth, median income, or changes in the cost of a nutritionally adequate diet. Uh, the median income idea is a relative one where the threshold would increase as median income increase. Uh, the cost of a nutritionally adequate diet was an argument made by the Social Security Administration to uh, uh, base that the initial threshold on a uh, uh, an idea of an appropriate diet. Uh, in fact, there was a debate between the Social Security Administration and the Council of Income Advisors, which was ultimately uh, won by the uh, uh, Council of Economic Advisors and Bureau of the Budget to not base it on a uh, nutritionally adequate diet. In fact, because of that, Molly Oshansky, who is credited by many with creating the poverty measure, actually re-engineered uh, 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 her numbers to get that same 20%. Uh, and then, as uh, Angela said, you need to have a measure of uh, uh, income that is appropriate uh, for uh, uh, capturing the uh, uh, measure of deprivation that you're in, in counting. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is a, uh, in the official poverty measure, they have a money income pre-tax post in cash uh, transfer measure of income. Uh, we're going to uh, broaden that in a full income measure by looking at post-tax, post-transfer income, including the market value of health insurance. And we're going to use the household instead of the family sharing it. Next, next slide. Uh, I'm only going to be talking about the official poverty measure and the full income poverty measure. Both of them are anchored in 1963. Uh, the, the official poverty measure uses a, a CPI measure which overstates poverty. We'll use the PCE. Uh, they uh, use a pre-tax uh, uh, measure that doesn't include in-kind transfers uh, and they don't include uh, health insurance. We're gonna improve that by uh, including both of those. Next slide. When you do this, you get quite a different story about what's happened to poverty over time. The official poverty measure, as Angela showed you, uh, goes uh, down to uh, about 10.5% from uh, 1905 and 1963. When you actually use this full measure of absolute, uh, 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 an absolute measure, which only increases by uh, the inflation rate, uh, uh, appropriately measured, and you're, you're including in-kind transfers and other government transfers, and also the effects of, of taxes uh, transfers, you get a dramatic decline in uh, poverty down to 1.6 in 2019. Uh, so based on historical, stand uh, historical standards, uh, material well-being in terms of engagement, our war on poverty is largely over and a success. However, go to the next slide. Uh, if, uh, oh, and uh, sorry, let me just add that the news is even better. If you use that poverty rate in 1963, half the black population would have been in poverty. Uh, today, they're uh, just about equal to what it is for uh, all, uh, well under 2% uh, uh, for children. The same is true of 60% in 1963 for uh, older people, 65%. So it's been a tremendous success if you're basing it on 1963 standards of living. Next slide. If in if alternatively you used uh, a relative measure, uh, you first have to set that at 19.5, which would be 50, uh, 0.55 of median income. 
and you get a much uh, less success. Uh, it goes from 19.5 to 15.6. So it's tremendously important to decide whether you're talking about an absolute or a relative one, but based on Johnson's notion of absolute standard, there has been tremendous success in terms of reducing poverty. Next slide. Uh, the other measures that uh, Kevin and uh, Bruce are gonna talk about fall somewhere in between these two measures. Uh, uh, absolute uh, measures uh, show greater uh, reductions in poverty. Uh, the SPM, which is a relevant one, but, uh, much less success. Next one, next slide. Why is this? Well, because you would have to increase uh, uh, the original threshold by almost 18 times to uh, get them to track median income. Whereas uh, the official poverty measure, you only have to increase it by eight times over this period, 63 to 2019. Uh, for the PCE, which we use 6.4 times, and for uh, Bruce's uh, Bruce Myers a piece, 4.6. Okay, next. And uh, you also, uh, uh, with, when you use the official poverty measure, you don't include the value of Medicaid or Medicare or SNAP or these other programs. And these programs, which didn't exist in 1963, now make up a large percentage of the uh, uh, value of transfers uh, that government gives to people. Next slide. All right, all of this comes down to one, uh, one picture. And picture this in your mind. Take a look at that red distribution uh, uh, in, in uh, excuse me, the uh, blue distribution in 1963. Uh, the uh, median income in 63 was $17,000 in uh, 2019 terms. Uh, the threat, the absolute threshold was $9,867. And this, this blue uh, distribution is what Bob Lantman showed uh, to President uh, Johnson. Uh, the absolute threshold gets you uh, uh, of 9867 gets you 19.5% uh, poverty. Uh, population. If you then look at 19, uh, 2019, there's been a tremendous shift in the distribution of people to the right. That is, all people are much better off than they were in uh, 1963, when you compare them in the cross sections. Uh, and if you then look at how many people are still uh, way down there at 1963 thresholds, it goes down to the 1.6 that we talked about. However, if you're using a relative threshold, then you, you notice that the uh, uh, median income in uh, 2019 is 40, $49,163, and 0. 0.55 of that uh, 49,163 is $27,000. And that's why the relative uh, population in poverty is 15.6 of that uh, red distribution. Next slide. Uh, the bottom line is, relative or absolute, uh, clearly President Johnson's war on poverty based on his terms of engagement uh, was a success. If you, for instance, uh, decided that the population in poverty in 2019 was 10.5, which is the official poverty measure, uh, and you put that measure and those thresholds back to 1963, 70% of people in 1963 would be in poverty based on 2019 standards. Whereas for the official poverty measure, it would still only be uh, 20%, and for real uh, poverty measure, more like 15%. Next slide. So uh, here's the great news uh, uh, that uh, uh, that the war on poverty was success in base of getting people off poverty. What's the less great news? Did people get off poverty, get, get out of poverty by working? What this shows you is the share of the population with less than half of their full income from market sources. Uh, and it turned out that in uh, 1967, you can only go back to 67, uh, 18 only 18% of black uh, uh, folks were uh, uh, had income that uh, their full their income from market sources was less than 50%. Uh, what happened over that time, as you increase the amount of resources that were going uh, to them from government, that share of people whose market income was more than 50% uh, uh, fall uh, 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 rises uh, uh, to 30% uh, uh, by uh, 
the uh, 70s gets as high as uh, 33 percent uh, by the early 90s. And then it's only with welfare reform and a, a movement to uh, uh, subsidize work rather than transfers that you see a decrease in the share of people who have uh, uh, market incomes uh, that are less than half their uh, uh, full income. Uh, the same is true for uh, children and for uh, uh, working 80 people. Next slide. So bottom line, based on historical standards of material well-being and the terms of engagement, President Johnson's war on poverty is largely over and a success with respect to poverty reduction. But this reduction in poverty was mainly driven by substantial expansions of the social safety net via federal government taxes and transfers, not by increases in self-sufficiency. So it's really important to decide how you're going to incentivize people to get out of poverty. Uh, and that's why it's so important to have a good poverty measure to show you this, uh, this success. And uh, it is clearly time to begin a new war on poverty, the poverty thresholds that recognize current living standards, but one that focuses on giving all Americans a chance to develop, and use their capacity so they can share as others share in the promise of this nation. Final slide. Uh, this effort to create a better measure of poverty actually started in the Trump administration with the 2019 intergenerational or interagency technical report uh, on evaluating alternative measures of poverty, which Bruce Meyer was one of the uh, co-chairs of that. And the final report in a, uh, a, an amazing Amer miracle of uh, 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 the bureaucracy, uh, the final report actually came out January 8th, uh, 2021. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Kevin Cole. Thank you, Rich, for the introduction. I'll be talking about the Supplemental Poverty Measure. The Supplemental Poverty Measure, or SPM, was currently published by the Census Bureau alongside the official poverty measure. The SPM was first developed in 1995 in a National Academy of Sciences report entitled Measuring Poverty. It was motivated by the widely known shortcomings of the official poverty measure, namely its failure to adjust for taxes and the exclusion of in-kind transfers. This was in spite of the fact that refundable tax credits like the Earned Income Tax Credit and later the Child Tax Credit provided major relief to working families. In addition, in-kind transfers, including food stamps and rental housing assistance, had become major components of the safety net. The National Academy's report rightly recommended accounting for this broadened set of resources. It also sensibly recommended a broader sharing unit that included cohabitating partners. Despite these clear improvements, the SPM makes other things worse. First, the SPM thresholds are unnecessarily complicated, obscuring the fact that poverty thresholds are scientifically arbitrary. The SPM thresholds were originally set at the five-year moving average of mean spending among two adult, two children consumer units at the 30th to 36th percentile on food, clothing, shelter, and utilities, multiplied by 1.2 and set separately for families who rent their home, own their home with a mortgage, and own their home without a mortgage, and then adjusted further based on each metropolitan area's housing costs. Rather than provide a transparent threshold that the public can actually understand, this overcomplicated definition produces 46,710 different thresholds in a given year. This overwhelming complexity makes the scientifically arbitrary decision about where to set the poverty threshold look scientific, when in truth it is a value judgment. Second, the SPM thresholds are updated in a way that makes it nearly impossible to interpret changes in poverty over time. Rather than update thresholds with inflation, the SPM increases thresholds based on a five-year average of spending on specific items. This makes it difficult to determine whether poverty rose because poor people were worse off or because spending on certain items shifted at some point over the past five years. Third, the SPM sets higher thresholds in areas with higher housing costs. While higher housing costs mean families have fewer resources available for other items, higher housing costs can also reflect better conditions of places, such as more access to public transportation and better funded schools. In fact, research by Bruce Meyer, Derek Wu, and Brian Curran finds that geographically adjusting poverty thresholds in this way leads the SPM to do a worse job in identifying the most deprived Americans. Fourth, like the official poverty measure, the SPM excludes the value of health insurance, 
thus missing over $700 billion in transfers to low-income Americans each year. The SPM attempts to partially account for health insurance by deducting medical out-of-pocket expenses from resources. However, this approach is counterproductive because obtaining health insurance can lead an individual to seek out more medical services and thus incur more out-of-pocket expenses. This would lead someone who newly obtains health insurance to look worse off, according to the SPM. As a result of its shortcomings, the SPM does a worse job than even the official poverty measure at identifying the disadvantaged. Pioneering work by Bruce Meyer and Jim Sullivan empirically tested whether the SPM performed better at identifying a poor population that was more deprived across a wide number of outcomes. To the contrary, they found that the poor population, according to the SPM, was better off than the poor population according to the official poverty measure. For example, the SPM poor had an average annual consumption of over $29,000, compared to less than $27,000 for the official poor. 34% of the SPM poor had private health insurance, compared to just 27% of the official poor. These results suggest that the changes that SPM made to the official poverty measure were, on net, counterproductive. The shortcomings of the SPM have not prevented it from becoming more prominent over time. When it was first produced by the Census Bureau in 2011, the SPM was included in a standalone report entitled The Research Supplemental Poverty Measure. But starting in 2022, the SPM was featured alongside the official poverty measure in the same official report. For example, trends in the two poverty measures, as well as comparisons of poverty rates for different demographic groups, are shown together in the single poverty report. There is now growing risk that the SPM could be elevated even further. Earlier this year, the National Academy of Sciences published a new report recommending that the Census Bureau elevate the SPM to the nation's headline poverty statistic. This is particularly concerning because, as the National Academy's report notes, the Office of Management and Budget, Budget could proceed to ordain the SPM the new official poverty measure, which would have profound effects on government programs. In a recent paper, I estimate that making the SPM the official measure would increase government spending on SNAP, or food stamps, and Medicaid by $124 billion over the next decade, because eligibility for these and other means-tested programs is tied to the official poverty line. Such a move could also reallocate federal aid from low-income states like West Virginia and Mississippi to high-income states like California and New York, due to the SPM's geographic adjustment of poverty thresholds. From a measurement perspective, the new National Academy of Sciences report makes a couple positive recommendations including using linked administrative data to correct for misreporting of income and surveys, considering the resources of all household members for determining poverty, and better capturing the value of home ownership. But it also doubles down on the most concerning aspects of the SPM. It would establish a separate need for health insurance that would require the Census Bureau to determine how much health insurance is adequate, and that would preclude the ability to assess changes in absolute poverty over time. More broadly, it recommends a multidimensional approach to poverty measurement that assesses whether families consume enough health insurance, enough housing, enough child care, and potentially other items, where enough is determined by the recommendations of the National Academy's panel and the Census Bureau. These decisions would put the Census Bureau in a compromising position because it would be forced to make value judgments about what items are basic needs and how much is enough. Over the past decade, the SPM has become increasingly prominent in spite of its shortcomings. It is thus increasingly important for policymakers to be aware of the limitations of the SPM for informing the nation's progress in fighting poverty, as well as the policy implications if the SPM were elevated even further to the new official poverty measure. Thank you. And with that, I will now turn it over to Bruce Meyer, who will discuss recent advances in poverty measurement and how best to move forward. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to talk about modernizing poverty measurement. Much of this talk is based on joint work with Jim Sullivan, Derek Wu, and others, including those in this webinar. I'm required to say that any opinions and conclusions are my own, not those of the Census Bureau, and that our results have been through disclosure review. 
What I'm going to say is largely in two reports listed on this title slide. The reports are an interagency technical working group report and an AEI report, both from 2021. You have already heard that the OPM and SPM are more misleading than informative. The OPM doesn't count most of what we do to reduce poverty. The SPM tries to, but relies on data that badly underreports key programs and income sources and badly imputes taxes and tax credits. The SPM also moves the poverty thresholds, essentially the goalposts, in odd and opaque ways, so it is hard to interpret. Next slide. I'm going to make five observations. First, poverty thresholds are fundamentally arbitrary, so can't be decided scientifically. Molly Orshansky called the measure she helped develop arbitrary. Robert Lampman, the intellectual architect of the war on poverty, called the threshold subjective rather than objective and qualitative rather than quantitative. Ivan Falegi, the longtime chief statistician of Canada and a giant in the field of government statistics, quite eloquently states that poverty is intrinsically a question of social consensus, is intrinsically judgmental, um, and should be decided through the political process, not by a national statistical agency, which prides itself on its objectivity and whose credibility depends on the exercise of that objectivity. As you heard from Rich Burkhauser, even the original poverty threshold set in the 1960s were picked to achieve a desired rate with the food budget decided on to achieve that end rather than the other way around. The implication of this observation is that the focus of statistical agencies and researchers should be on resource measures, as thresholds are largely a political, not a scientific decision, and should be left to policymakers to decide. Next slide. Second, income benchmarking shows pronounced underreporting. When Census Bureau survey data are compared to individual tax or program data, or when weighted appropriately and compared to accounting totals, they almost invariably indicate that under income is underreported. Often close to half of a given income source is missed in the current population survey, the source of official poverty and inequality statistics. Pension income is sharply underreported. The CPS misses more than 60% of unemployment insurance and 45% of single parent EITC recipients in recent years. Importantly, underreporting has worsened over time, and research shows that the impact of survey income underreporting on poverty measurement has also increased over time. Next slide. This figure shows that the share of individuals below the poverty line using progressively broader income concepts. The rate based on uh, survey data alone is in maroon, while in gray you can see the rate from survey data combined with a good but not complete set of administrative data. The last two bars indicate poverty based on income after taxes, expenses, and in-kind transfers, which is close to the SPM income concept. In 2016, the rate is 9% based on survey data, but 5.3% when we substitute administrative data where we can. That is a 41% lower poverty rate. These figures do not include administrative data from TANF, general assistance, workers' comp, or unemployment insurance, 
We know from comparisons to aggregate data and microdata links that over one third of each of these other programs is not reported. Thus, we are certainly still overstating the share of people below the census poverty line. Next slide. What are the implications of the observation that income is sharply underreported? Well, you've seen first that the share of individuals below cutoffs is much lower than reported. Second, since the problem has worsened over time, poverty has fallen much more uh, than reported. Thus, the true decline is even greater than what Rich Burkhauser carefully elaborated in his presentation. The static poverty reduction of many programs, not accounting for behavioral changes, is greater than reported. And fourth, the Census Bureau's poverty-related publications are misleading. The Social Security Administration, on the other hand, stopped publishing two survey-based publications with their 2014 editions because of income misreporting. Most important among the implications of income underreporting is that like the SSA, the Census Bureau should stop publishing poverty statistics until it has the combined survey and administrative data in place to measure income accurately. Next slide. Third uh, observation is that an alternative to correcting underreported income, given that it is difficult to obtain all of the administrative sources, is to use consumption data. Consumption data provide a more direct measure of living standards and have other advantages. Consumption data identify a more deprived group of poor individuals, which is the goal of poverty measurement. More specifically, suppose you consider classifying people as poor two different ways, first with income, then with consumption data. Suppose you do it in a way to keep the share that you call poor constant so that you're looking at the same share of the population uh, in the two ways, comparing apples to apples. Using consumption data, those who are classified as poor are in worse health, have lower education, live in worse housing, have fewer appliances. Thus, you identify a more deprived group when you use consumption data. Consumption data are particularly useful when trying to identify the very worst off because at the very bottom of the recorded, but not necessarily true income distribution, underreporting is especially pronounced. One of the common ways for someone to look like they are poor when they are not in a survey is for a main income source to not be recorded. The implication of this observation is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics should continue to publish consumption poverty measures, which they started doing this year, and should be given the resources to do it well. Next slide. Fourth, proposed poverty measurement changes should be validated so that they are based on evidence. Proposed measurement changes are almost never rigorously evaluated by the National Academy of Sciences or Census. We can often directly examine whether a modification to a poverty measure helps achieve the goal of poverty measurement, i.e. identifying and counting the most disadvantaged. The SPM in general does not improve poverty measurement. Handling of health insurance is one key reason. The SPM subtracts out-of-pocket spending for health from income, leading those who can afford to spend more on health care to have lower SPM adjusted income. But in practice, it turns out those individuals tend to be better off. A second reason the SPM validates poorly is that it takes expenditures on housing in different geographic areas and uses the data to construct an index of living costs across locations, which it then uses 
to adjust poverty cutoffs. However, the areas where people spend more on housing are markedly better areas for the poor, according to a wide range of indicators, including mortality, health, assets, long run income, housing characteristics, ability to pay bills, education, and food security. Next slide. Fifth and last, the National Academy of Sciences process is flawed. Why does this matter here? Congress has asked the NAS to provide advice on topics including poverty me measurement and a legislative agenda to reduce poverty. Unfortunately, this ostensibly scientific body has been too willing to accept projects that mix scientific tasks with political judgments. Saying this pains me because the NAS does important work. I come from academe where a debate is currently raging as to whether academic leaders should take political stands. I think what is more clearly wrong is to argue that something is scientific when it is really a political judgment. The NAS has been used for political purposes with participants seeing it as the goal. In selecting its report authors, it chooses a narrow group of individuals. Scott Winship here at AEI has documented the overwhelming political slant of the report authors using FEC and other data. The NAS has a troubling funding model relying on parties that stand to gain or lose from report recommendations. There have been recent instances in which consequential errors in reports have gone unacknowledged and uncorrected. For example, the recent roadmap report on child poverty. An implication is that Congress may also want to reflect on whether they are getting scientific advice for their money. I'd like to uh, pass um, the speaking on to Angela Rashidi, who is going to uh, mediate a discussion between two of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Bruce, Rich, and Kevin. Um, really brilliant. Uh, so now I'm going to bring in Matt Whitinger and Scott Winship to the conversation. Um, obviously, uh, Rich, Bruce, and Kevin have highlighted the complexities, not only of thinking about what poverty is, but also how we measure it. Um, so Matt, you have spent you know, many years um, before coming to AEI, you did spend many years on the Hill kind of working with policymakers. Um, can you just give us your perspective? Um, how, do, how do you kind of think about all of these complexities and how should policymakers think about it? Sure. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I'll make uh, three basic points. And the very first one is just to restate the obvious that we've just heard. Um, current government poverty measurements are seriously flawed. They offer a distorted picture of poverty in America, and that's a problem. For example, it's widely known, has been widely known, as Kevin said, since, for decades that the OPM misses an increasing share of benefits that are paid. So this chart shows in blue some of the major anti-poverty benefits that are counted to determine whether somebody is poor under the OPM. And then the stuff that's not counted, the taxpayers provide every year and in, in increasing amounts that is not counted towards the OPM. So for decades, this went on and people you know, pointed to annual census poverty reports and said, you know, look, this is, um, poverty is too high. Well, you know, not surprisingly, if you ignore rising amounts that taxpayers are providing, then you will get a distorted picture of what exactly is poverty uh, in America. It's a serious problem because taxpayers paid for these growing benefits and should rightly expect that we recognize their value in helping low-income families, um, but they don't. So, And then, as Kevin said, there's the, the supplemental poverty measure, or the SPM, which was nominally designed to address those and other flaws, but has major problems of its own. Um, as we heard, the SPM isn't an absolute measure of poverty like the OPM, but instead is more of a relative measure, of sort of of income inequality. Um, one of the other key problems with the SPM is it sets its poverty threshold higher than the OPM, which is one reason why, um, you know, we, Kevin went through his slides quickly, but if you, if you think back, 
when the SPM was officially started to be uh, uh, reported by the Census Bureau, SPM poverty, counting those additional red benefits that taxpayers provided, was higher than the official poverty measure. And one reason why is because this dynamic of having a higher poverty threshold. So it, it basically has a higher goal than the OPM, um, despite counting that additional, uh, that additional income. So in effect, and especially if you live in a world that the left wants to occupy, which is that promoting work and earnings um, is not your real goal in the course of designing anti-poverty programs, but instead you want to depend on government benefits, government benefits have to be constantly expanded to reduce SPM poverty because of this rising and increasingly you know, rising uh, poverty threshold compared with the official poverty uh, threshold. If that's not bad enough, the SPM would also significantly change where poverty is apparently found. So this third slide, like the second one before, it comes from a report that Kevin uh, has issued. Um, it shows how adopting the SPM standard, and a large part of this is because of housing and, and that, and there's a whole long story there, moves where we think of poverty being. Um, doesn't get talked about very much, but uh, in effect, Poverty would all of a sudden be worse in places like California, New York, Washington State, places we think of as relatively well off. And um, it would be better in all sorts of Southern red states. Um, now, it doesn't take a genius to connect the dots here and recognize there is a key political dynamic there, that poverty would be moving from red states, where I think it's widely accepted that there's, there's significant poverty, two blue states that are often considered to be relatively better off. Um, that surely was not lost on the SPM designers. And as Kevin suggested, if Congress ever considered these implications, like the, you know this sort of general dynamic, um, it would unleash a food fight of epic uh, proportions, on especially the floor of the Senate, because you would literally have states fighting over where anti-poverty funding is going, and California would be a winner and places like West Virginia, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, you can see the dark red states would be would be losers. So um, that has all sorts of political implications and is one reason why I, uh, members should be wary of this sort of idea that the SPM should become the official poverty measure. So first point, our current government poverty measures have serious flaws. Second point is that key policymakers and the media have long recognized those flaws, and some have actually exploited them to advance their policy agendas. So think about the OPM. It misses a growing share of taxpayer-funded benefits, as the first slide showed. Yet for decades, policymakers on the left would say, oh, well, look at the annual poverty report. It's too high. We need to provide more government benefits. Well, if you ignore many of the government benefits that are provided now in determining how poverty looks, you're going to get exactly that outcome. And then on the, on the right, some looked at the, basically that same picture and talked about the stubbornly high um, poverty levels in America and said, oh, well, anti-poverty programs don't work and should be cut or eliminated because of that reason. Both views were wrong and they basically exploited why what the OPM didn't show. And more recently, lawmakers and the media have used the SPM to advance the case of specific benefit expansions, like the expanded child tax credit during the pandemic. But they rarely mentioned in doing so that that shifted to using a new poverty measure entirely, the SPM instead of the OPM, much less the SPM's significant flaws, as Kevin walked through. So during the pandemic, for example, um, New York Times headlines started focusing on SPM effects instead of the OPM. Those headlines suggested when temporary benefits paid in response to the pandemic were paid, poverty plunged. But, you know, they didn't talk about how there were tri literally trillions of dollars added to the debt then. And then when those temporary benefits went away as policymakers provided in the legislation that they enacted, including Democrats' American Rescue Plan, child poverty, according to these headlines, soared as never before. It really didn't. All it did was revert back to where it was before the pandemic and before those trillions of dollars in benefits all added to the debt were paid. So, um, there's an interesting sort of sidebar here. Now, in the wake of those benefits going away, certain policymakers who are very pro reviving and expanding the child tax credit again, like Senator Michael Bennett uh, of Colorado, 
spoke at a hearing this summer and called the Biden economy savage because it lacked the expanded child tax credit that was paid in 2021. Not surprising that it goes well against the uh, administration's desire to pump up the um, pump up Biden uh, Biden economics as you know some sort of economic panacea. Um, and AOC recently made similar comments about the cruel economy uh, that people are living in, uh, in that sound almost more like Republicans than like Democrats would typically ex uh, express at this point in the administration. So my third and final point is. Until policymakers settle on a better way of measuring poverty, and I think Rich and Bruce and others have kind of pointed in that direction, those policymakers and their, their aides need to understand these dynamics and explain how they distort the picture that other lawmakers and the media try to paint of poverty in America. That's unfortunately complicated, but it's actually very, very important. The good news, and there actually is good news at the end of the story, is that promoting work especially in combination with work-based benefits like the EITC and the child tax credit, has in recent decades resulted in steady progress in reducing poverty in the United States. Better, po I'm sorry, better poverty measures show that that progress is even greater than the gov current government measures indicate. That's actually a bipartisan success story that's pretty rare in this town and a record that is worth defending, especially when some people want to change course and pay far more taxpayer benefits to individuals who don't work, including those who are unwilling to work as uh, AOC kind of infamously put it in calling for her new Green New Deal. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to our further discussion. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so Scott, let me pull you in. Um, I'm fully confident that you can provide the most amount of clarity on this issue <laughs> for all of us, right? Is that what you're gonna do? Uh, um, sure. <laughs> But seriously, I mean, clearly there are political motivations to maintain a sense of confusion um, and maintain complexities around poverty measurement. Um, and so just, you know, tell us, how do, how do you think about this issue? Obviously, you've studied it for many, many years. You've worked with, you know, Congress. You've worked with um, the Senate on these issues. Just like give us your perspective and kind of how do you think about it? And then how do we how do you think we need to move forward? Yeah, thanks, Angela. So I, I think um, I think the first thing I would say is it's absolutely I, I agree with everything that everyone has said about uh, some of the incentives um, for progressives to kind of focus on the official poverty measure and the extent to which it hasn't gone down for, say, kids uh, as much as as we would like. Um, because then they can argue that we need more government support uh, in order to uh, lower the rate further. Um, when in reality, you know, we've we've lowered uh, the child poverty rate in particular quite a bit. Um, there is sort of also a corresponding tendency for folks on the right uh, to sort of focus on the, the official poverty measure too, because then you can say we fought a war on poverty and poverty won, right? Which um, you know, I, I think is uh, you can make a case um, that that's true, uh, but but you can't make the case. You, you can't say accurately that we haven't reduced point in time uh, poverty. Um, we've we've been very successful as as Rich's work in particular uh, shows. Um, so so that's an added piece to it, I think, is that there are some political incentives on both sides to uh, to stick with what we've got. I think, um, you know, moving forward, there's, uh, I think, a, a, a welcome conversation happening um, that includes folks from a lot of diverse perspectives uh, in academia and outside academia who agree that the official poverty measure uh, isn't really working for what uh, policymakers need it to do. Um, it doesn't identify well who's, who's poor. It doesn't uh, accurately depict trends over time. Um, so what do we do about that? And, and I think here, uh, you know, there's um, there's a movement, I would say, that's predominantly within academia uh, to embrace the supplemental poverty measure that, that Kevin mostly discussed uh, and to say that this is the right way to look at poverty um, and we should ditch the, the official poverty measure. Um, and we should focus more on the supplemental poverty measure. Um, that's clearly what the National Academy of Sciences report wanted to do in terms of the research reports that the Census Bureau puts out. Uh, they want to make 
essentially the, the supplemental poverty measure, the principal poverty measure, uh, and downgrade the official poverty measure. That's just a very controversial decision um, if, if that's the way that the Census Bureau goes. Uh, and it's, it's controversial because um, we need to think about these two different aspects of the poverty line that you laid out, Angela. Uh, it's, it's about comparing resources to thresholds. Um, everybody across the political spectrum uh, who does research on poverty agrees that the resource measure in the official poverty measure is is not good. Um, it just doesn't include you know all of the uh, non cash benefits that we use to try to reduce hardship. Um, there's a lot of underreporting, uh, as Bruce said. There's any number of reasons why the resource measure is uh, that that we need to improve it. Um, that's where the consensus is. If we move forward with that uh, and said let's get the most accurate resource measure measure that we can uh, that we can think of, um, you would I, I think you would have literally nobody object to that. Um, the problem is uh, that people want to do different things to the thresholds. Um, so within academia, uh, you have this weird split where um, uh, the, the most important work, in my view, uh, on poverty measurement that's being done by Bruce, by Rich and Kevin, um, historically uh, has been done by people like Christopher Jenks. Um, and uh, that has taken an absolute threshold as a given, um, has said like, you know, the arbitrary, the, the poverty line is fairly arbitrary. Um, we'll set it either where the Census Bureau sets it or somewhere else. And we'll focus on measuring the resources correctly. Um, that that has a long tradition going back uh, at least to the 1980s. Nick Eberstadt, our colleague here at AEI, did work on this in the 1980s as well. Um, it, however, to, to jump to this idea of, uh, of playing with the threshold in the way that the supplemental poverty measure does, um, is is much more controversial just because folks haven't uh, done the work uh, other than than Bruce and Jim Sullivan to determine whether you're identifying poor people better um, by changing the threshold in this way. Um, so that's occupied a lot of time among academics um, that that I think has uh, jumped over the question of whether these different methodological decisions are better. Um, the other line of research that you see among some academics is to look at trends using a relative poverty measure. Um, and I don't think that's especially helpful either, because, again, the, the sort of historical consensus that we've had in the United States uh, is that we should use an absolute threshold. We shouldn't use a poverty threshold uh, that if everybody uh, ends up better off over time, um, but incomes don't rise quite as much among people at the 20th percentile as they do among people at the 50th percentile, um, that that can indicate increasing poverty um, just doesn't make sense to a lot of people. If everybody's incomes go up, poverty can decline. Uh, it, it's just not intuitive. It mixes up thinking about inequality um, and, and thinking about poverty. Uh, so it's fine if people want to do that, um, but it sort of skips this this. Um, consensus that we've that we've got uh, historically in the United States that we should have an absolute poverty measure and we should measure poverty uh, in that regard as, as best we can. Um, the final thing uh, that I guess I'll say that I think has been unproductive among poverty researchers, mainly in academia, uh, has been this movement to look at uh, extreme poverty, $2 a day poverty, for instance. Um, uh, Catherine Eden and Luke Schaefer, I think, famously you know, had a book on $2 a day poverty in the United States, which has just been definitively debunked by myself, by Bruce uh, and his colleagues. Um, $2 a day poverty doesn't really exist in the United States. Uh, I would argue, based on Bruce's research um, and on some of the work that I've done, that we can't actually even really measure deep poverty very well uh, without access to administrative data. So deep poverty is usually considered uh, whatever the poverty line is, you take 50% of it, um, and that's the deep poverty line. But the the underreporting problems are so severe uh, that, that we really can't get a handle on deep poverty without access to the kind of administrative data that the Bruce has had in the past. And he's shown you get very different... Uh, you draw very different conclusions um, if you measure deep poverty in the right way. So there's been this wholly 
unhelpful effort to claim that uh, even though maybe the poverty rate has declined, deep poverty has increased over time. And honestly, that's tied to a political agenda. It's tied to an agenda that uh, welfare reform had uh, these costs for people who uh, who weren't able to find employment. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's sort of trumpeted by people who want to argue that welfare reform in 1996 was a mistake, that we need to roll it back, that really what we need to do to solve po poverty is just give people money uh, through an expanded child tax credit, uh, universal basic income, uh, what have you. Uh, and I think that is a big mistake that maybe we can we can talk about later on when we talk about policy. So uh, I, I think the best work that's being done on this is being done by Bruce and by Rich and by Kevin and, and others. Um, that's the productive way to go uh, if policymakers want to understand poverty today and what's happened to poverty over time. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, let me bring back in Bruce, Kevin, and Rich um, just for kind of a final discussion. Um, and I might sort of pose specific questions to each of you, but you know, feel free to jump in as, as um, you have something to add. Um, but I do think it's true. I mean, when the Census Bureau reports their annual poverty numbers, uh, they, I mean, I do think they present it in a way where, that it's a reflection of science um, and kind of wrongly in my view. Um, whether it's, you know, the official poverty measure, they kind of present it as that, you know, we've identified these basic needs and here's the percentage of the population that doesn't have enough resources to meet that. And even on the SPM, it's kind of, you know, they present it as here's what people spend on these kind of core basic needs and, you know, do people have the resources to meet that. And so as we've heard, I think quite convincingly today, those thresholds that they're using for those measures are by nature subjective and arbitrary. And so then that clearly suggests a role for political actors. Um, and so maybe Rich to you first, because I think you've, you know, really tried to emphasize this point. Um, you know, if that if that introduces a role for political actors, I guess, well, one, do you agree with that? And then how do, what what does that mean? <laughs> like, what what role do those political actors need to take in order to kind of address this issue? So uh, the uh, quote I uh, mentioned at the beginning by uh, Heller was in the uh, this book, the uh, Economic Report of the President, but it, the president was President Obama in February 2016. And in this uh, report is uh, a discussion of what the CEA does. And I think I speak for people who have been at the CEA as well as academics who have that vision that, that what the uh, uh, what economists can do is show you what the distribution of income is. And there's some disagreement among us in how to do it. But when you go to the point that you are uh, trying to determine what is scientifically arbitrary and that Bob Lantman wisely uh, uh, demure in doing. If you read read, read the, uh, the book of his, he he just says, "Well, it just came about." Well, I think having been at the CEA, I think I know how it came about. It came about because Bob did a great job of showing the distribution, and then said, "Mr. President, uh, this is your decision. We don't, we can't we don't have a mechanism that will tell you what that threshold uh, is." And you have to make that as a, as a policy decision. And I think that's where academics need to be humble. Uh, if we're speaking as politicians, then speak as politicians. But you can't rely on academics to give you uh, an, a, a scientific way to measure an arbitrary concept. And what you get in the worst case is uh, sort of a, a Chinese Mandarin class that creates a, a complication so great that they confuse people about it and toss that off as science. And that's what we shouldn't be doing. Well, and Bruce, let me let me turn that question to you because you're an academic. Um, you know, you you obviously have a lot of colleagues that you've worked on with in terms of poverty measurement. Like what Rich is saying in terms of being humble as academics. Like, do you see that as a reality um, among some of your colleagues? Um, I think people are a little bit um, 
too confident about what they say about the poverty rate and how it has changed. Uh, you can see that in the debate over how poverty changed in the last few years for children. Um, and it's been argued that uh, the poverty rate fell in half and that in 2021 and then doubled in 2022 for kids um, based on SPM or SPM-like calculations. But if you look at the income data that goes into the SPM, you see that most of the fall and then rise in the poverty rate was due to uh, economic impact payments, due to um, uh, uh, those payments, not the child tax credit. And the part that is due to the child tax credit, as indicated by the SPM, um, a good part of it, um, half for the lowest income people, is due to an accounting choice, which is to put all of the 2021 um, CTC as being received in 2021, even though uh, half of it was received in 2022. And so that's just an accounting choice, not an indication of people's actual well-being. If you want to look at people's actual living standards, what they're able to purchase in the way of food and housing and clothing, then you want to look at a consumption measure. And a consumption measure over the last few years shows a very steady decline um, through uh, 2022, not this um, big increase in 2022 that the White House and various media, media outlets have been uh, trumpeting. And um, you can understand why when you look at an actual measure of people's ability to purchase goods, you don't see this huge decline in poverty and big increase, it's because part of what um, the SPM shows is just based on this accounting choice about when you arbitrarily allocate um, tax credits. And then people um, saved uh, during the um, the period where they were getting all of these economic impact payments. And you can see that in the data and so that people are able to smooth out their, um, e their uh, spending, even those very close to the poverty line um, were saving quite a bit uh, when they were receiving all the government benefits during the pandemic. Well, yeah, that's a good example of kind of this perception of scientific being scientific when really there's there's so much more that goes into goes into that. Well, and Kevin, I think you offer kind of a unique perspective because you've been both in you know an academic environment and also have worked on the Hill and Joint Economic Committee. Um, you know, what's your perspective on this question? Like, it, it, you know, do you trust kind of your academic colleagues to be humble, as Rich describes? And then on the other side, and then I want to go to Matt and Scott to kind of get your perspective on the other side, like the political actors, Congress, like, are, are they well equipped to try to, to you know, answer this question of what th should the threshold be? Well, thanks. I mean, I, I don't know if I have a lot of trust for anybody. Um, <laughs> Although I do, you know, certainly respect the statistical um, agencies that are implementing um, the data products that we use, I would make a distinction in terms of which political actors we want to set these thresholds. So in 1964, it was President Johnson um, who really set that 20% baseline poverty rate um, that was used as the initial threshold or baseline for the war on poverty. The problem is that now Congress and um, the year since has tied eligibility for Medicaid and food stamps 
um, ACA, Affordable Care Act premium tax credits, uh, dozens of other programs to the official poverty line. And so now it really would be inappropriate for even a president um, to change that poverty line. Um, it now, I think, falls onto Congress, um, given these implications for government spending. Um, if we were to do anything that would sort of change the level of the poverty line or to geographically adjust such that there's different poverty lines in different states, um, the reallocation of federal aid across geographic areas is a question that Congress would need to get into. So given the fact that Congress has gotten us into this world where programs depend on a value judgment about the poverty line, it has to be now Congress's job to make such dramatic changes. Yeah, and so maybe Matt, which, you know, what's your perspective on this? And, and it makes me wonder if we do need to have some measures that serve the purpose like academic for academic reasons, and then we also need a measure that maybe Congress, you know, has input on that's sort of an official or federal measure. But yeah, Matt, I'm curious your your thoughts. Yeah, so um, my first thought is if you're looking for humility, you shouldn't go looking to Congress uh, for answers to these sorts of questions. Um, I mean, uh, in, in 2021, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, so Democrat uh, drafted, supported, and, and President Biden signed legislation that um, extended or expanded the child tax credit for one year, right? Um, and that was done specifically because they were concerned that they didn't have the money as part of the, I think it was $1.9 trillion that was spent under that sort of one-time bill to extend the child tax credit expansion for more than one year. So policymakers made a decision, this is gonna be really popular and it's gonna be great. And there's gonna be by acclamation a, a demand to extend, expand this thing further. And so we don't have to worry about paying for that. We'll just do the one year version and then everybody will love this and it'll be great. Turned out not to be so. Um, and it, in terms of Congress's overconfidence, um, that law was built, Wall Street Journal had a piece about that bill that said that the people supporting the bill knew it was a one year extension. And even before it was signed into law, they were saying, hey, we can't not extend this thing because that would cause poverty to rise. So like, you know, policymakers are very aware of these dynamics as they're doing it. They're using this data to advertise what they propose as, you know, great policy solutions. And then they're using the same data as cudgels to continue expand those, those policies, expand other policies, uh, those things. I, I, you know, looking at the history of this stuff, I don't have great faith that Congress is going to come up with some better measure. Um, it, it, it's like the OPM was used as a cudgel for expanding benefits. Now the SPM is used as a cudgel for expanding benefits. And all of this sort of flows through these poverty reports that the Census Bureau puts out, various academic experts propose and all that. But then policymakers turn around and use the shorthand version of, which is do X and you will cut poverty or the converse, do Y, and you will increase poverty. Um, so I, I, I would be leery of that. My message to sort of regular Americans thinking about this is, do your homework here, because a lot of what is said in this space is really sort of political jargon that's run through this machine of um, rhetoric and, uh, you know, and sort of the, the sort of gives the appearance of being policy specific and, you know, informed and absolute and all that. And it's really not. A lot of it is just sort of the political machinations of one or the other party saying, we have the solution to this, and it happens to be our preferred policy proposals, and that will achieve these ends. But it may not, and we may not even be counting the right stuff. So um, that's kind of a windy way of saying I'm not terribly confident that Congress is going to be the body that's going to uh, come up come up with a good solution to this. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, and Scott, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. Otherwise, I do have kind of a final question that I want to start with you, and then and then go to the rest. But if you if you have any further thoughts, um, just on the ability of you know Congress to kind of take on this issue, <laughs> academics to take on this issue. Uh, no, I I, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what Matt said. I might be. I'd rather have uh, an imperfect official poverty measure than than none, um, just because I do think it's important that we be able to track uh, hardship to some extent, um, but but certainly the one that we have as 
just a ton of flaws. Um, I hope we'll sort of get to also kind of what the what the goal ought to be uh, here in terms of uh, dealing with poverty. I don't, I don't want to step on that if that was your last question, but if it's not your last question, uh, I might say something uh, now. Yeah, actually, it was incorporated into my last question. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think the kind of the question on the top of everybody's mind is how is the U.S. doing <laughs> when it comes to poverty? And as we've laid out today, that is not an easy question to answer. But I do want to kind of pose that to the group um, and then bring in, Scott, you know, what are things that have worked, um, like what have led to those trends, and then what can uh, policymakers do to either continue those trends or to, you know, continue to reverse um, or to reduce poverty. So, Scott, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Um, okay, yeah, the, the point that I wanted to make is um, I think it's really important for policymakers to think hard about what the goal ought to be here. Um, and I just say it can't be to minimize the point in time poverty rate, even the point in time child poverty rate. Um, and the reason that that can't be the goal is that any decision that that any policy decision that we make is going to have costs. Um, the, the budgetary costs are obvious. I don't really want to focus on that. I want to focus on two other costs. One is uh, just unintended consequences. Um, if we gave everybody enough cash uh, to raise everybody above some arbitrary thresholds and, and, and put the poverty rate at 0%, um, the, the, the problem with doing that, even if we could afford it, is that we would uh, incentivize um, certain behaviors, attitudes, uh, habits uh, among the population uh, we get less work. Uh, Bruce and Kevin's research shows that definitively, that if we'd made the child tax credit expansion permanent, uh, there would have been a million and a half uh, parents that would have uh, gone from working to not working. Um, that's going to have implications for kids, even if they're above whatever poverty line you want to draw. Um, it's going to incentivize single parenthood, um, which also uh, is going to be harmful for kids. Um, it's going to disincentivize saving, uh, investing in your own human capital, getting extra school or training. Um, so it's going to have a lot of, of other consequences. And then the other cost, I think, is just an opportunity cost about what, what we could do with limited uh, federal resources. And there, I would say, you know, we've got much bigger problems, uh, or, or, or I would say we've made much less progress uh, on certain problems than we have on poverty reduction. Um, the up the the rate of upward mobility out of poverty uh, from one generation to another, uh, as far as we can tell, hasn't really improved uh, over decades. Um, this period where we've reduced child poverty by quite a bit, we've not increased uh, intergenerational mobility over time, suggesting that we need a different set of policies to do that. Um, and, and then finally, the breakdown in social capital uh, over the last 50 years uh, has been, you know, consistent in terms of uh, church going, family strength, uh, trust in institutions, um, communities working together, spending time with your neighbors, that's all down. Uh, and it's not obvious what the policies would be to reverse that, but it is pretty clear that that's a much bigger problem that we that we've not devoted enough attention to uh, than than reducing poverty rates. So I think, you know, that's the answer to the question. You know, why don't we just, uh, you know, what's so bad about reducing cutting child poverty in half, for instance? How can you be against that? Um, the answer is, you know, there's other goals we need to have, and there's other ways that we can reduce child poverty that uh, that, that won't have these um, these costs. Well, that's a good point, and that speaks to. I mean, Rich, you talked about. I mean, you showed the trend, obviously, of the you know the dramatic declines in poverty, but then you followed that up with this you know these trends in dependency, um, and argued that the. Um, reduction in poverty maybe was at the expense of increase in dependence. So do you share some of the concerns that, that Scott just outlined? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so did Linda Johnson. And that's why I made the uh, second point that people often forget that his uh, administration wanted people to become self-sufficient. Uh, and that's an important uh, uh, policy uh, outcome that can't be ignored, or you get the kind of uh, situation that Scott's talking about, where uh, you give people 
uh, cash without any expectations of work. And we know uh, that that uh, leads to less work. And the, I mean, the great era of my research, which goes back into the 70s, is the 90s, when uh, a Republican Congress and a, a Democratic uh, uh, president uh, uh, initiated welfare reform because they realized that policies matter in terms of behavior. And uh, I'm seeing books now. There's a new book that says that, that uh, we got it all wrong, that uh, that has led to much worse outcomes. So this is clearly a, a fundamental debate between what I see as sort of progressive economists and more conservative economists of do we care about the behavioral consequences of uh, uh, giving transfers out? And maybe just to end, Kevin, Bruce, Matt, I'm just curious, do you think that this, um, maybe obsession's too strong of a word, but obsession with kind of point in time poverty numbers and how to reduce those, um, it is going to have these negative consequences like Kevin and Bruce, you have suggested with employment, you know, Matt, you've also talked about that. Like how concerned are you about this um, kind of focus on point in time poverty uh, rates? Oh, Bruce, I think you're on mute. Yep. Yes, I'm quite worried about this emphasis on point in time poverty rates that it is being used to argue for a universal basic income for families with kids. And as Rich and Rich talked about, and I think everyone here has worked on it one time or another, um, we saw these huge improvements in living standards among single parent families, um, in the 90s with welfare reform. And I'm worried that some of that progress might be reversed. Um, and that's a, a potential problem of this emphasis on point in time poverty rates, especially ones that are badly uh, measured um, as we've been through. And just to add to that, I think we need to remember the effects on long-term child outcomes as well. Even if you provide short-term cash assistance that could lower poverty at a point in time, you know, we focus a lot on the labor supply effects that that can lead some parent to drop out of the workforce. Uh, but there's also potential effects on kids um, over the long run. Um, so we've seen in lots of research that programs like the earned income tax credit that reward and require work lead to really positive outcomes for kids in the short run, they get better test scores, but also when they become adults in terms of higher earnings, less dependency, less likelihood of ending up in prison. Um, and so if we're not focused on all of those effects as well, we may end up doing more harm than good, especially in the, the long run. Yeah, I, I definitely share those concerns. You know, in the last decade, we've seen this sort of trend, especially among uh, folks on the left, of just giving cash, right? Like, go, in effect, go back to the AFDC system of providing low-income families uh, with kids, especially with just checks. And the the child tax credit um, is kind of emblematic of that. We had a program that was expanded uh, in ways that it never was before. That said, we're going to give monthly checks to low-income single parents, including those who are not working. And the amount paid to non-workers can be exactly the same as the amount paid to, to workers. And uh, you know, uh, Kevin, uh, Scott, Bruce, uh, Rich, everybody's right to be concerned about the work effects of that. I think it's also worth throwing in that you know we, we tend to have these conversations about poverty and sort of assume people are just kind of widgets and this is sort of you know dollars in, dollars out, and we give them money that affects the poverty number and people are just sort of subject to these larger forces. They're not. Um, the scholars, Ian Rowe, uh, Ron Haskins, Bell Saw, who, who created this uh, originally, who talked about things like the success sequence, make it clear that the way people order their lives can have a significant effect in terms of their likelihood and their children's likelihood of being in poverty. Marry before you have children, finish high school, work full time. These are not heroic things. These are you know, what used to be known as norms. Um, and the people that do that tend to have extraordinarily low poverty rates, kind of on the order of what uh, Rich and Bruce were pointing out uh, in terms of 
their, their figures. Um, so individuals have a lot of agency when it comes to these questions too. And it's not just a question of how big is the government check you're gonna be and what are the terms uh, associated with those checks? Great, thank you. And I think we will make that the last word, Matt. Um, I just wanna thank all of my AEI colleagues, Matt, Scott, Bruce, Kevin, Rich, um, for the enlight enlightening conversation. Um, and to the audience, we appreciate your time and we hope to connect with you again soon. Thanks so much.